Austin Show, Unleashed. Unleashed. All right, everybody, welcome to Steve Austin Show. I am coming to you from the Broken Skull Challenge Compound out here in Agua Dulce, California. Please bear with me if my voice sounds tired. It's because I've been yelling motivational phrases to competitors competing out here at the Broken Skull Challenge. We are on day two of filming, day three of production. Hey, folks, the new Podcast One app is now available for download at the App Store or Google Play. And there isn't another podcast app like this one anywhere, and that's because the new Podcast One app is loaded with some cool features that let you do a lot more than just listen to your favorite shows. You can access behind-the-scenes photos, articles, and connect with other fans of the shows you like. And you can watch over 1,360 virtual reality videos. You can actually watch some of your favorite shows in virtual reality. So get to the App Store or Google Play and download the new Podcast One app now. All right, folks, coming up today, I've got Don Callis back on the show. As you remember, Don Callis, along with Lance Storm, have a podcast under the Jericho Network on Podcast One called Killing the Town. Make sure you give Don and Lance a listen on the Killing the Town podcast on the Jericho Network on Podcast One. Hey, man, this time we just started shooting the breeze about his career and just talked a little bit about pro wrestling. We're going to cover some stuff at WWE, ECW, and TNA and just shoot the shit. Some of his gimmicks like the Jackal, the Truth Commission, the Human Oddities, and even some of them that never got off the ground like the Messiah. He's also going to talk about how he got into being a color commentator and what it's like working with New Japan Pro Wrestling. Folks, right now, before I get to Don, I'm out here filming the Broken Skull Challenge show for CMT. It's hotter than blazes out here. Having a good time. It's been a good shoot so far. I think it's going to be a great season for uh, CMT, and I'm really enjoying spending time around the athletes as they come out here. we got a crew of hardworking people out here, and we're working our asses off to uh, try to make a hell of a show. I'm going to keep the open to this show very short, and I want to get to my conversation with Don Callis. But first, if you're looking to buy a new or used vehicle, then you need to check out TrueCar or download the TrueCar app. When you register with TrueCar, you'll see what other people in your local area paid for the car you want. And from there, you can connect with a local True Car certified dealer and enjoy a more confident car buying experience. True Car shows you real pricing on actual inventory, so you see competitive pricing off to you by True Car certified dealers for vehicles that are actually on their lots. And you'll also see all the dealer incentives before you get to the lot so you can feel confident about the price when you show up. True Car makes car buying easy, no matter if you're looking for a brand new or used vehicle, and the stats don't lie. Over 3 million cars have been sold to True Car users by the True Car Certified Dealer Network. There are over 13,000 dealers in that network, with some 700,000 pre-owned vehicles available. So do yourself a favor and go to True Car for your next car buying experience. True Car doesn't just make the process easier, it'll also save you some money. True Car users save an average of over $3,000 off MSRP. So when you're ready to buy a new or used car, visit True Car to enjoy a better car buying experience. Some features not available in all states. There are 120,000 unsolved murder cases in America. It was the next day that I found out from my parents what had happened, that my sister was killed. Each one is called a cold case. Sometimes you have to look really closely to find the evidence. Damn, I, I killed her. Damn it, I killed her. Cold Case Files, the podcast. Garcia is walking into the home of a real monster. I was nervous. I realized what kind of person I was dealing with. It's a goosebump moment. Download new episodes every Tuesday on the Podcast One app or subscribe at Apple Podcasts or PodcastOne.com. Steve Austin, Unleashed. Unleashed. Rolling sound over here at 316 Gimmick Street with Don Callis. Don, how are you? Doing awesome. Well, you know, we uh, had the last podcast we did and we talked a lot about New Japan Pro Wrestling coming up and some WWE stuff, Mm -hmm. bullshit back in the day. Uh, Let's uh, let's kick out some uh, wrestling stories because... When we left off, we were talking about the Halliburton Cowboy, your briefcase. Back in the day, when you got into the business, for some reason, all the boys carried briefcases. Yeah. You know, and if you was making any kind of money, you had a Halliburton. Yep. If you was making good money, you had that gold Halliburton she was bragging about last week. Or if you were making no money and were a mark from Canada, you had one. <laughs> it was perception. <laughs> it was. 
I remember I had to have the briefcase because all the boys had them. And, like, when you roll into a territory, dude, I rolled in from Dallas. Mm -hmm. I got into Memphis. First of all, I was getting the shit kicked out of me in Dallas. I was working a full-time job at a truck company, you know, freight company, driving a forklift, loading, unloading trucks. I go to the territory. I'm a new guy. See, everybody's got a briefcase. Well, shit, I got to get one. Man, I went down. I can't remember if it was Kmart, Walmart, Target, wherever the fuck it was. But I got... I, I would say I got it in my closet, but we just remodeled this in a different closet. But it's just an aluminum piece of shit briefcase. <laughs> I still got it because it's still yeah. good. But I just had to have that briefcase. Yeah. So we all went through the briefcase stage. Were you a part of the territory or the system back in the day where everybody had the clutch bags? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And those a, are the, back the, now. Yeah, they're, yeah they're, they're back or they're making a comeback. The clutch bag was about, I don't know. Eight nine inches long, yeah. you know, five inches wide, yeah. whatever, and you could zip it open. It's like a, a man purse. Yeah, slots for your credit cards, your cash, mm -hmm. whatever. So, went through the period when all of a sudden, I, I think that was the first period when I got in in '89 in Dallas. Everybody had the clutch bag. My problem was I had to get one, and I think mine was even eel skin. Mm -hmm. It's probably faux eel skin, yep. fake eel skin, because I couldn't afford a real one. Busting out the French there. My pray off. <laughs> my my uh, my problem was, dude, I'm forgetful as fuck. So I would just put it up on top of my car, sit there and shoot the shit, and one of the boys, I was in drive off. <laughs> you know that freak out moment? Where the fuck's my clutch bag? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's about six miles back, <laughs> motherfucker. Yeah, I lost two of those bitches, and yeah. that's when it's like – Okay, I, I'm not cut out to carry the clutch bag because I'm too stupid. Yeah. And then here comes the fanny pack. And I'm thinking, dude, I'm in tough guy mode right now, okay? Yeah. A couple of years in the business, yeah. fanny pack. Ain't no way I'm going to wear a fanny nope. pack. That's bullshit. <laughs> you see the tourists, old people? Yeah. That's for them. Yeah. Sure enough, six months later, had a fanny pack because all the boys had them. And it was yeah. a thing to do. Turns out it was a great fucking gig for the business because, this is speaking for myself, yeah. <clears throat> credit cards, cash, all your receipts. You, back in the day, you, you dealt with a lot of quarters, nickels, stuff yep. like that. Carried yep. your change in there. Always had a pen, a couple of pieces of papers. If I saw a billboard, writing ideas down, gimmicks, yep. all kinds oh, of yeah. stuff. So the fanny yeah. pack, after swearing I'd never you know used one, couldn't be caught without one. I even wore some out on Monday Night Raw cutting promos. Yep. Then when I left the business, fanny packs weren't cool anymore. Went to a money clip in my front pocket. That's where I'm at today. But going back, uh, the clutch bag and the fanny packs. How was that error for you? Uh, I had the clutch bag. I had the same problem as you, that I leave stuff places. And I, of course, got a black one. And I like black, so I had a black Lexus back then with a black interior. So you put that motherfucker on the... I mean, it's gone, right? Like, you're never yeah. going to notice it. It's why I have a loud red cell phone cover, so I don't lose it. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so I had one, and then I switched to the fanny pack. I was same as you. I'm like, oh, this is... But all it takes is you would, in the business, you'd see a guy like you or someone else doing it, and you'd be like, oh, this is cool. And then I had to get me the high techs, you know, and the shorts. <laughs> and, and everyone was like, I mean, I don't know if you started the thing with the shorts and the high tech, but everyone was doing that. Like, high tech made lots of money off the boys. And, and so I, was, I bought into all that stuff, you know. Here's a quick story for you. I've never told anybody, but it's been so long ago. Back in the day, you know, I started wearing those high-tech magnums just because I, I yeah. like wearing them. They were bad They're comfortable. Boots. You could yeah. wrestle in them, too. So, anyway, uh, I was going to start doing – I wasn't going to start doing anything Hollywood-related, but for some reason, Vince thought I needed an agent. <clears throat> so I had an agent just to handle outside stuff. So the high tech says, "Hey man, we'd like to, you know, pay Steve X amount of money to wear high techs. You know, he already wears them. We'd like to endorse him." I'm so I'm take this to my agent. Hey man, this is what high tech Magnum wants to do, and he says, "You know, me being a fucking idiot back in the day, listening to the manager and his infinite wisdom. It's like the guy, you know, Chris that broke me in, Chris Adams. He's yeah. going to solve my hair problems. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is the the agent, so he knows all the answers. Hey man, what do you think?" X amount of dollars represent these boots. He goes, Steve, I really think we ought to wait on someone like Nike. <laughs> I bought it. 
I got to keep my voice down because there's room <laughs> echoes. But the last time I checked, Don, Nike don't make no stomp a mud hole in your ass and walk them dry boots for some beer swilling, foul mouth redneck on Monday Night Raw WWF to rock. Uh, no. Especially for the kind of dinero they're paying Jordan and everybody else. Yeah. So thank you, agent, for goddamn giving me the, the shittiest advice I've ever been given in my entire wrestling career. And you might have got the Nike deal if you'd proved yourself with a high tech deal God so he double fucked you riding or walking <laughs> in them. I, I guarantee you i whooped a lot of ass in him some bitches but anyway that, that was my and, and the other one that i got on to was chewing skull because i was never a tobacco guy and i was a guy who if i smoked a cigarette i got a head rush but i was always nervous before matches and being around the building I, not in a bad way but just nervous and i always had a cup of coffee in my hand i had to have something in my hand it was like an oral it's thing funny how that works you know and, uh, and then, like, some of the boys, you know, they're, they're chewing or whatever. So I'm like, okay. So I tried it, and I didn't like the rush that I got. What I liked was the spit, the, mm, the whatever. It, it relaxed me. It would almost replace that coffee cup in my hand. So I started doing that a lot and, and kind of – and then when I got into the business, I'm like, I probably should back off this. So – I guess what I'm saying is I marked out for every trend in the business and, and adopted it. But No, but it's funny because there's just uh, – when you're driving down the road, there's just a million different ways to pass the time as if – you're already going to be sitting in a car. You're probably booking a territory. Yep. You got yourself on top with the championship belt, but you got to be doing something else, spitting in that water bottle or whatever. So back in the day, you know, playing Little League Baseball, I started doing the Skull Bandits, then graduated to Red Man Levi Garrett chewing tobacco. <clears throat> then after chewing tobacco for years and the business, up and down the road, Red uh, – Renegades Rampage was one of our sponsors mm -hmm. of World Class and USWA. So, hell, I got free red man chewing tobacco. Hell, I was in heaven. Was making $5 a match, but I was getting free <laughs> chewing tobacco. <laughs> anyway, after doing that for years, kind of gum started eroding. And so, you know what? You might want to stop this, Steve, and change over to something different or more healthy. Yeah. I'll switch to Skull and Copenhagen. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, when, you're, when you're a chew guy. Yeah. And you see a dip guy, two different things, because you're, you're using, what do you call it, uh, smokeless tobacco. Yeah. It's in your mouth in different spots. But chewing tobacco, you spit a lot. Skull, you don't spit as much. It's mm -hmm. not a, as much volume. Whole different thing. But it's still that nicotine type thing. Yeah. So anyway, got into the skull thing for a long time. And, you know, hell, I quit cold turkey. Jesus Christ, Don, at least 10 years ago. And it was for the uh, – because – you just had to do something to occupy time. Yeah. And so you rode down the road, and that's what we did. When I quit, I was miserable for about four days. Fuck. It was like a second on a clock. Every time it ticked, that was like a minute. Yeah. And then I'd go to the gym and just wouldn't even want to work out because I couldn't even concentrate. But then I got over that. How was quitting for you? It wasn't bad cause I, because I didn't like the nicotine rush. Like I'd prefer to have a drink to get a to get a buzz or whatever because the nicotine rush made me dizzy and I I feel sick. So as soon as I'd start to get the rush, I'd take the dip out, have some diet coke or whatever, and then I'd put another one in. So I didn't miss the nicotine. What I missed was the process because putting that dip in my mouth in the car became part of my creative process. Like I'd find like okay, let's talk some shit now. Blah blah blah. It it wasn't necessarily helping me, but it, it I associated talking about wrestling and figuring things out with having a dip in my mouth or a cup of coffee in my hand. It was like, I guess, a social crutch almost for me. So quitting was hard in terms of like, and I started eating more too because it's like, you know, it. it so that's where it really kind of fit in for me. But just uh, the coffee cups. Man, if there ain't a coffee maker in the back of the dressing room, I don't know that there'd be a wrestling show. I've never, I've worked for some promoters who don't have coffee and I never understand that at all when I worked I worked for TNA for seven months uh, after I did my MBA and um, we would work the Nashville fairgrounds and it was a shit building you know no air I've conditioning said that before. Thank it's a you. horrible building and um, they had catering for us in the white trash cafe at the end of the road we'd go down and do catering and it was fine but they had a thing like where they wanted you in the building. And I'm like, I'm doing the Mr. McMahon gimmick there. I'm not wrestling. So it's like I'm there from 1 until 8 o'clock at night when the show starts. And it's fucking brutal because there's nothing to do. Um, and they had no coffee. And I used to say to Jeff, like, 
maybe we should get a coffee maker in here or something, you know? And I was jonesing for it, and they wouldn't. So finally, um, Shane Douglas is a good buddy of mine, and uh, I said, Shane, you know, let's uh, let's fizzuck off and go to Starbucks, right? And uh, he's like, oh, we're going to get heat. I go, oh, don't worry. So I went to Scott Damore, and I said, ask Dutch if he wants a coffee, and, you know, I'll get you one too. So, oh, yeah, great, you know? So Shane and I would go to Starbucks for ourselves. We'd be gone for three hours, you know, doing the run. And we'd come back with coffee, and then we're allowed to do it. But it really helped me because you're sitting around there all day with no coffee. You start falling asleep like it's brutal. And I faced that a bit in New Japan. They've got like a coffee maker with pods in the back. But I sometimes feel funny because, like, I'm not one of the boys. I'm not taking bumps, so I don't want to. So I usually just try to bring my own in. Yeah, but God damn, you're the grizzled American veteran. That's right. I think you've earned yeah. your right to a cup of joe. Well, I gotta be car- I gotta be careful because I start talking shit about opinions or tell stories, and I just I guess not arrogantly, but in my head, I'm like, oh well, they know that I used to wrestle, right? Because to me, when I hear guys talk shit about the business and they've never taken a bump, I get turned off, right? But like, why would these these kids don't know who the fuck I am? Like, they don't. And why would they care? So it's like I always kind of try to like make sure that okay, like they understand I took bumps and paid dues and came up the hard way. I'm entitled to talk about some of this grizzled veteran stuff, you know. So uh, I kind of ease into it, I guess. Okay, here's one for you. And this is an open platform. If you've got an idea, if something comes to your mind, go ahead and throw it out there. Or we can kill my podcast. <laughs> oh, I'm kidding you. Speaking, Carney. Mm-hmm. Back in the day, you got into business. I was in Chris Adams wrestling school. Shit, we was just learning the basics. Chain wrestling. Well, first of all, we learned how to just tumble, mm-hmm. roll, and take bumps. A flat back bump, slapping the mat. That's what we learned. Then a little bit of chain wrestling. Chris never taught us no carny. You get in the business all of a sudden, the boys are back there doing the gimmick, the giz gimmick, and talking like that. And what the fuck's going on? So you're riding down the road with the gorgeous Gary Young, and you learn to speak carny. Yeah. How was this in Canada it's, for it's you? It's not that hard to pick up. <laughs> it's, it's pretty fucking The tough. really funny thing yeah. is that uh, I taught it. My friends who weren't in wrestling picked up on it. So they'd use it, you know, and they'd say, oh, that chick just gave me the office. Like, so all these guys that are not in the business are using it. I remember I was with my cousin one day, and uh, he and I were real tight. And we were, like, talking some stuff about some girl, and his wife was there, and, like, she was cool. And I said something like, blah, 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 pee his aunties. And she looks at me, and she goes, you know, this isn't really that hard to figure out, and I understand what you guys are saying. I'm like, yeah, I guess it doesn't really. It's not like speaking Chinese or something. So, so. Who broke you into the language. Uh, was it incumbent uh, well, upon you to learn the system? I, I don't think we had to, but I think I I liked the idea because we were very much protect the business. That's how Tony brought us in. So learning Carney was a part of kind of protect the business, and. Um, yeah, I think I think I just picked up on it from some of the Calgary boys that were in. When I broke in, they were still shaking hands with the one finger, you know, which I actually do now just to mess with people. <laughs> so, uh, so it was it, it was so old school. It's I'm like, why do you shake hands like that? Oh, so people don't think I'm stiff. Okay, um, you could still be stiff even though you shake but hands what, like what that. What about that, that handshake? Because I would always call it kind of like the 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 bird. Perching on a limb. Yeah. That's yeah, the kind of yeah, grip that it was. Yeah. So I, I I remember I started doing that for a while too. I did it for a couple of years. But you know, as of a decade ago, I don't man, I sink her in deep. It's yeah, a proper yeah, handshake. Yeah. If you do if you do that bird landing on a limb gimmick, I mean you're out. Yeah, I mean, what the fuck is wrong with you? <laughs> and that's and I think I really clued into it when I went to New York in ninety seven. And everyone was doing the big handshake. And it's like, oh, shit, I hope I didn't do this gimmick because that'll really. But, I mean, that's one of those things where, where the environment there, people will notice. My first uh, road show for WWF, I was on a flight to Minneapolis from Winnipeg. And I got my boarding pass. It was business class. You know where this is going. I'm the new guy. I'm like, oh, cool. Because I'm like, oh, WWF, we all fly business class, right? So I get in there. I'm sitting in business class. Undertaker <laughs> to the back. <laughs> the Rock to the back. I'm like, what's going on? I'm the only one in business class. And I'm like, I think I walk back, and I don't remember who I talked to. I said, um, I wouldn't mind switching seats with someone if they could come up there. But it's like, you know, you don't know, and you don't want to say anything, but then you're the only asshole sitting in business class, and you're not taking bumps. That makes it even worse. So uh, some of those stuff, those things, I think you kind of learned uh, the hard way of, 
you know, this is how I've learned to do this, but it's not really what's going on in the business. And you look like a mark if you do it. So moving right along yeah. other trends in the business that, uh, you notice coming up or things that you went through. Yeah, I, I guess it's funny, like the stuff I remember I used to do, like the Randy Savage, like off the top rope, ax handle to the floor. And that was kind of like, not high flyer stuff, but that was like, holy cow, you did a big high spot. Now that would be nothing, right? I remember trying to do a moonsault in 94 because that was like the thing in the business. And I remember going to like a diving coach to figure it out. And I could just never get comfortable doing it. So I, and I only ever wanted to miss it. That was, I wanted it as a high spot, as a heel. But now a moonsault, like everyone does it and it's a nothing thing. Um, I think that so many of the lessons that we were taught coming up in the early 90s or whatever it was, are a lot of the things that some people say, oh yeah, grizzled veteran, whatever, bitter, but they're the hardest parts of the business. It's a lot harder to get a reaction. Like Bret Hart, you you control the crowd with a headlock, you know, because you knew how to work. That's the art form to me of the business. And that to me is what is lost. And the concern that I would have from a kind of a business perspective is who's teaching that stuff? Because if you're not in the ring with a guy who knows it, you're not like, I think it's awesome that Terry Taylor, who was my tag team partner in Canada for a couple of years is the finishing coach at the PC. It's probably the best decision they could have made. But unless you're getting the ring time with those guys, like I always used to say, I learned more in a match with Rick Martel, Jim Brunzel, those old time guys than I would in 500 matches with someone else. So how are those guys going to get that stuff? So I think that to me is the, the part that's missing and it, I think it can be gained. Like I look at New Japan and I go, people think Japanese wrestling's all high spots. And it's funny, Tanahashi, who um, I kind of was talking to you about before, who I think is like a Japanese Kerry Von Eric from a charisma perspective, mm-hmm. he was asked about the difference between Japanese wrestling and American wrestling. He said, American wrestling is, is, is too fast and they do too many high spots, which is the opposite of what you would think someone from here would say about about wrestling. No, I actually uh, raised my eyebrows when, when uh, you said New Japan would be too, too many high spots because I don't think, and watching uh, like Okada Omega, those yeah. two matches. Selling. It was all selling or execution of an offensive move. Yeah. It wasn't a spot fest. No. I mean, not from a, a headlock position or, or anything, an arm bar, and then sending someone in doing trademark high spots. Yeah. So no, I don't. I don't see that with New Japan wrestling at all. I just see mm-hmm. it as high level work, paced and a good pace. Mm-hmm. And you you certainly need to hit the gas pedal in certain spots, slow down commas, periods, exclamation points, with respect to the cadence or speed or mm-hmm. flow of the match. But I don't look at New Japan wrestling as a high spot fest at all. Mm-hmm. I think I think some of the criticisms I'll hear from people who maybe don't know enough about the business is there's not enough selling. And I'm like, the main matches are all selling that. Right. It, and it's really good selling. And you know, you can't necessarily, the Japanese fans are very different now. And people say, well, you know what? I laugh when I hear fans start to do sing along chants and do all this stuff. I mean, uh, I remember working with bulldog Bob Brown in 1989 and I think people started chanting boring and he just sat on the chin leg. And he's like, Oh, uh-huh, now we got him, kid. You know, <laughs> He's like, I'm like, aren't we going to get up here? Fuck them. You know, like, and the idea was, and I believe this, we're working them, not the other way around. Right. And so um, an, another thing that I think is messed up about the business, like I think the fans, people say, well, the fans pay their money. They should be able to do whatever I want, that whatever they want. If I go to an NFL football game and I start running around singing, chanting a bunch of ignorant stuff and distracting people, I'm getting thrown out. You know, if you go to Cirque du Soleil and you start doing that stuff, you're getting thrown out. So why wrestling fans think, but part of it is them. And part of it, I think is, I still believe with the fans today, you give them something to lose themselves in and they're not going to do that stuff. So part of it's what they're being presented and how it's being presented. And that's not a reflection on the boys. It's a reflection on the environment of some of the companies. Is it not proper etiquette then, Don, to go to a Cirque du Soleil show and start a This Is Awesome shit? <laughs> or, or, or sing some sort of uh, British soccer anthem? No, I mean, I, 
I probably wouldn't do that. I mean, you're not going to go see Macbeth on Broadway or wherever and uh, and start yelling stuff at the actors either. So. Hey, speaking of Macbeth, and I know nothing about Macbeth, but I was on your Twitter account and fast forwarding through the pictures, and there was a picture of you <laughs> dressed up in like a Robin Hood outfit, except it was green or red. Yeah. What was up with that? So uh, when I was in university, I was I uh, did a minor in theater, uh, mostly because they had really good parties. But it actually was good for my wrestling because you know you yeah. had to be on stage, and so um, I went out. But I was always in like the Stanley Kowalski kind of Brando type roles back then. Someone got the bright idea to put me in a Shakespeare play. It's something called Shakespeare in the Park. And I'm like, okay. So they're like, oh, yeah, you have nice hair. You'll look good in the outfit. So they give me this outfit. Now it's 100 fucking degrees, and you're outside in the park. So it's hot as a motherfucker. And uh, and I was the worst Shakespearean actor ever. Like, I sucked. No, don't be so hard on yourself. <laughs> How are you? I was really bad. Did uh, you kill the territory? I, I think I killed Shakespeare in the park for sure. <laughs> and, uh, but I, and they took these pictures, which are just like heat-seeking, ridiculous photos. So I thought it was funny to, to tweet it out. Yeah. What was the picture of the dude laying in the leopard thong on a bed reading a book? <laughs> I think I was ribbing somebody, and I can't remember who it was. It wasn't a friend of mine. Got captions, I'm thinking, man, I got to get in this guy's head and find out what the fuck's going on. I, I think I was ribbing. It might have been Disco Inferno or something because we had a little thing going back and forth. So, what, what about the black mask? So uh, when I went to Japan, one of the things I noticed, because I'm still at base, I'm still a wrestler. So even though I'm a color commentator. I want to I want to get over, but I don't want to get over in a way that takes away from the talent. So when I went to Japan, I noticed everyone wears white surgical masks, and I'm like, oh, this is kind of a funny gimmick. If I did this in Winnipeg, people would go, oh, get me noticed a little bit, right? And I was in the airport in Tokyo one day, and I saw these two gorgeous girls, models, they must have been, and they had black surgical masks. I'm like, that's cool as shit. So I'm like, I'm just going to see what happens when I do this because it's something I can do to get over with the Japanese fans without taking away from the product. So as a rib on myself, in a sense, I wore these bl this black mask. Just when I walk out, I take it off when I call it. But it started to get over, and people started wearing them. And then, so I'm just like, okay, this is Black Mask Nation now. And, and, and plus, it uh, when you're out of the business 13 years... People are more shocked when they go, holy shit, what happened to his hair? What happened to his face? So it allows me to kayfabe. I just need one for my hair. But I did get one of my buddies. Uh, I took a photo with two of the girls at, at the show and all in black. And I didn't have a black mask. I gave them my black mask. I thought, oh, this would look better if I had a black mask. So I called one of my buddies. I'm like, can you Photoshop a black mask on me in this thing so we all have it? He's like, oh, yeah, no problem. I'm like, maybe give me some hair too. <laughs> and, and he's like, what kind of hair? I'm like, like vintage Brad Pitt. He's got good hair. So he, he sent me the photo and I tweeted it out. It's like Brad Pitt when he had like the frosted tips. It's just yeah. brutal. And I'm like, okay, we'll see if anyone notices. So do you wear the, so do you wear the black mask when you go to Japan? Uh, only when I like walk out in front of the crowd. I don't wear it like on the street. What about putting them out at the gimmick stand? They haven't allowed me to do that just yet. Uh, well, cross I, and I don't, I don't want to say that it's not over you, yet. <laughs> you still consider yourself one of the boys yeah, yeah, yeah. or a worker. I'd like to monetize it. Yes, absolutely. So I don't know how I do that just yet. Cut them in on a little bit of split. I'm going to get a photo of you in the black mask. I'd sell some. Do well, I mean, hell, I'd 316 on the front. I mean, there'd be so many cops stopping. We can... Guys stopped in here with well, that... a gun. That's the funny thing is if I went through security in Winnipeg or Minneapolis wearing that friggin' mask, but in Japan, everyone has them. This right. is a very different kind of culture. So gimmick thing I was trying to get over, and I'm not sure if it's over or not, but I'm not giving up on it. But the thing about the black mask, it just looked kind of sinister. It looked kind of cool. And I mean, I, I thought it looked cool. My, dude, my thing is. But again, you walk to a 7 Eleven that get up on? <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Down here. Looking at I you. might try this over on uh, La Brea or something. Yeah, tonight. the dude, the dude but, working behind is going to grab that see, shotgun see, underneath the cash register. See, my thing is, and I learned a lot from Jim Ross when I got to work with him a little bit as a color commentator. My favorite color commentator of all time is Jesse Ventura. I love Jesse. I thought Jesse hit all the right points. I always liked about Jesse, and I brought this when I worked with Joey Styles and ECW, and I try to bring it now with Kevin. Jesse would every once in a while remind Vince McMahon, oh, like when you were a wrestler, Vince. Like he just get that little subtle dig in, 
And Jesse was a rock star in his own right, Damn but right it, he was. never took away from the talent in the ring. And the other thing he would do is he might not, as a character, as a heel, he might not like Randy Savage, the baby face, but he'd always put over what a great athlete he was. And so I've kind of always tried to walk that line of, like, I want to be over because me being over helps me to get the talent over. And, and, and people have said, like, my color commentary style is very different right now because I'm very much like that 90s heel. So people know about Kenny Omega and our connection. Well, so I bring that into the commentary. And I'm very much like a Bobby Heenan supporting my guy. I'm almost that's half right. managing him as I'm calling his match um, because that's kind of how I came up in the business. And I think it's also a little bit different. And as long as it doesn't take away from the talent, then I think you've got something. Because that's your as a color commentator, your sole job is to get talent over. Right. And and I may not I may call a match of a guy that I think does too many spots or I don't like his style, but no one gives a shit that that's my opinion. I'm supposed to put him over, and if he's supposed to be the greatest thing since sliced bread, then that's how I'm going to do it, and I'm going to do it in a believable way. Right. When I used to call Rob Van Dam in ECW, and for a time I was top heel for Paul, Rob was my big nemesis. You know, I was trying to get Rob out of the company. I would say Rob was arrogant. I would say he was cocky. I would say he was always late. He's on the smiz, whatever. But I would always say, but he's the best athlete in the company, and that guy could walk onto an NFL team and be the starting tailback if he wanted to, right? Yeah. I'd always put it over. So it's kind of walking that line. I think that's what's fun about doing color. Hey, uh, just as far as uh, another segue, hell of a transition here. <clears throat> I was watching some stuff on uh, YouTube from you when you was with the WWF. Mm -hmm. And it says, uh, weirdest WWF segment ever. Also worst. <laughs> well, also, also, well, even before we get to that one, the, uh, the match between Steve Blackman and Recon. Yeah. And you come descending up, yeah. down from the rafters. Yeah. And I, I heard the story on the Chris Jericho podcast. Mm -hmm. It was a hell of a promo. Thanks. Um, it was my biggest um pride in that promo was that i cut that promo after sitting 80 feet above the ring uh in the dark for three and a half hours waiting to be descended so i was mentally so messed up because you can't see anything you can hear everything and you're just waiting and you don't actually know when your cue is until the thing starts moving and i'd gone over this promo over and over in my head and they told me i had like four minutes which is long right by the time they they lowered it, I'd forgotten everything I was thinking I was going to say, and I was so messed up. That was a cool moment for me because it was one of the times I thought, they honestly are now trying to push me. And I remember when they were, they were building this thing, and all it was, you look at all the safeties now, it was a, a plywood and one, uh, one, a two-by-six platform with four chains on it. There was no safety, nothing. I couldn't even lie down on it. It was that small. And I remember they were building it, and I'm standing on the, on the ramp at about 2 o'clock in the afternoon watching this going, okay, well, this is my push. You know, I'm afraid of heights, but this is my push. And Vince comes up behind me and goes, he goes, hey, Don, you afraid of heights, Pally? And I said, yes, Vince, I am, but I'm more afraid of not getting over. And he, ha, 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 tremendous. So um, that was, but then it was, we did that for one week, and then it was done. And so I think part of the challenge that I had there was like I was in my mind and I wasn't consciously trying to do it but because I came from a wrestling background, I'm trying to get myself over. Because to me, if I don't care if you're an opening guy, a mid-card guy, a manager, or whatever. If you're not over, you have no value. So I'm trying to get over. But it's like, okay, do, is, this guy, is this guy a manager? Because he's sort of his own thing and it's... I think it was something that people weren't all that comfortable with because it was like, okay, do we want this guy to get over? He's not wrestling. What's the payoff? You know. So whatever happened to Bo Buchanan, who was recon? Um, I don't know. He was a great guy though, and he was at six six and two eighty, a tremendous athlete. Now I think that, and and actually, um, the other guy, uh, um, Rambo in, in for Otto Vance, Luke Poiret was a hell of a hand as well. Now, the logic of putting a 6'6", a 6'5 guy with Kurgan, which to me made Kurgan look smaller, um, didn't make a lot of sense. But they were great guys, and I think that gimmick was just a challenging gimmick to get over and to be believable in, you know? 
Well, whose idea was it to put the jewel on your forehead? Mine. I mean, the whole cult leader thing was me, and I was like, I got to look different. Um, and if what I'm a the cult leader. What did when you pitch that? Um, well, it came from the, the promo I did in Hershey, and where they actually saw me looking different, and Vince Russo came up to me the next day, and he said, Vince loved your promo. He says, we got to get you out of that stupid outfit. He goes, can you find a new outfit? Well, I already had it. It was in my bag. And I'm like, yeah, I got it here. I put it on five minutes later. He goes, that's money. That's great. Um, and I already had the jewel. I'd already planned all this out. I'm going to be ready. And so that was kind of the deal. And, and the TV, how they found about that I could write television was when we, and I said, we also need to break Kurgan away from this gimmick and we got to give him his own name. Cause at that time he was just called the interrogator. And I was a huge mark for the Highlander movie. So I'm like, call him the Kurgan, the greatest heel ever of movies, you know? And so I wrote six weeks of TV cause just, I knew how to do it. And I was on a flight from Minneapolis. I ran into Jack Lanza. We're heading down to TV and uh, I always got along great with Jack. I'd grown up watching him. I love Jack. And I go, Jack, I go, um, I wrote some TV. Go, Let me see that. So I show it, he looks, looks at it, and he looks at me, he goes, where'd you learn how to do this? I said, I don't know, I was writing Tony's TV, I was, this is my ideas, you know, for the next four weeks. I'm going to show this to Russo. So he showed it to Russo, and it was right after that that I kind of got that first ask to, to start writing TV and move to Connecticut. So that's, I guess, how they kind of found out some of the ideas. Yeah, but you, you, you said something just then that a lot of people, uh, as I made my way from Steve Williams Steve Austin, stunning Steve Austin, given to me by Dutch Mantel, superstar Steve Austin, ECW, ringmaster, Stone Cold Steve Austin. The evolution, the, the process of finding who and what you are and not being afraid to you know, push the envelope or to take a chance. You were taking a chance or you had an identity. Yeah. You were going by what the office was, you know, that initial outfit, the writer, pants yeah, or whatever. Yeah. But so you thought about, you know, the black leather jacket yeah. the look i thought i had to come up with something for a reason why these three monsters are doing what i say and i thought i need to monetize it i need to make myself look like a star so i thought well okay like so i'm a guru i'm whatever so maybe i put this jewel on my head and i also thought that's a gimmick where people can do that themselves and it's a visual representation that i'm getting over and i used to do a deal i used to kayfabe one in my hand because i used to use double-sided tape and I would go and there, you know, you could tell when you're starting to get over, people have signs and they're leaning over to see you. And I'd always pick the prettiest girl who was leaning over and I'd go over and I'd pretend like I was holding her head in my hands and I'd be talking gibberish to her. And then I'd go to put my hand on her, on her forehead like I was blessing her, but I'd stick the jewel on her head and it would magically appear. So it was like this, it was all just me trying to get over and show that I had value. It's not that I wanted to be a cult leader or a manager, but I'm like, if I get over enough, good things are going to happen. And, and they started to because, like, they brought me in to work with JR on Shotgun Saturday Night in the studio. And I, I've, I've mentioned it before. I mean, I went out to use the bathroom and came back, and JR was on the phone with Vince. And I, I wasn't eavesdropping, but I couldn't help but hear. And JR was like, yeah, the kid's going to be a player, you know. And I'm like, yeah, I'm in. Um, but then nothing happened. Yeah. And then uh, and the other one that was a false start was uh, – I'm sitting at home one night. I'm off TV because they don't know what to do with me. And they had called me up and they had, they had, uh, Russo goes, I got a great gimmick for it. Because I think they got cold feet on the cult leader thing. And I knew we were screwed with it. We're in Waco, Texas. And I said, let me go to the crash site and let me cause a hubbub and let me not get arrested but get thrown off and let's get it on video. And they, and they wouldn't do it. I said, we're in trouble. So I guess they're worried about the heat. Russo calls me and goes, I got a great gimmick for you. You're going to be the Messiah. I'm like, the Messiah? Yeah, like Jesus. We're going to dress you all in white. We're going to lower you from the ceiling like you're on a cross. And I, I'm like, you know this is going to get nuclear heat in the U.S. He's like, do you care? And I'm like, nope, I just want to get over. So that never happened. And I'm sitting at home one night, phone rings, one in the morning. I think it's one of my buddies, you know. Is this Don? Yep. Vince McMahon. And I, I thought it was a rib. But thankfully, I didn't say, you know, oh, fuck yeah, off. This, this, this is the story when he flies you to L.A., right? Yeah. And, and I'm like, I get there, but then nothing happens. And, and it's like, it's so hard because you just feel like you're on the cusp of something. Oh, I'm going to have a long career. And I always thought I would stay there forever because I thought I can do a lot of things. So if I burn out as a wrestler, I can be a manager. If I burn out as a manager, I can do color commentary. 
if I burn out there, I can go write some TV. So I'm like, I'm gonna, I always thought I'd be there 20 years. So when I got the call that I was leaving, I was beyond shocked and flabbergasted by it. But, you know, it, it, it ended up being the best thing that ever happened to me because it forced me to go to ECW. And ECW, I got the best push of my career. I just want to say one thing where I first appreciated, and I think maybe where I first saw what would then become the Stone Cold character. My friends and I are sitting watching ECW, and you come out, and you were in some angle, and I don't remember, but uh, Nancy uh, Sullivan was out there. And she said something, and it, man, it was like, it's probably my favorite line ever from a promo. And you went, you went, well, you look to me like about a $5 piece of ass. Don't get me wrong. If I could scrounge up five bucks and get a clothespin to put on my nose, I'd give you a try. And I'm like, that is so, we pop so huge. I'm like, that is some edgy shit right there. Do you remember that? Yeah, I remember that uh, vividly. <laughs> that Man, was great. I tell you what, I had a good time in ECW, <laughs> and I, had, I, was, I was really frustrated, and I didn't have nothing to lose. Mm -hmm. Paul Lee brought me in. It knew I couldn't work. The the wing was still hurt. I, I would I think I would have two or three matches, but it ended up being a real good stop. And Paulie really opened my eyes, and that's when the light bulb went off as far as being able to cut a promo. Uh, going back to you talking about that jewel sticking on your forehead mm -hmm. when you stick that yeah. uh, jewel on uh, someone's forehead in the crowd. Every now and then, if I was working with someone, you know, like a Bret Hart, I would I would do a rib. I would get a sharpie and I would draw eye right there in the middle of my hand and then I put an eyebrow on it or eyelashes on it and so at some point probably about the 10 12 minute mark of the match or whatever this is house show stuff you know I'd go for the test of strength and I'd be looking at Brett and I'd go like I said look into my eye when he looked over to Paul with my hand and a big fucking eyeball <laughs> you know <laughs> You know Brett pretty well, right? Yeah, yeah, real well. When 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 you pop Brett, yeah. and you get him to put that little smirk on his face, and Brett's like the ultimate pro yeah, inside yeah, yeah. of the squared circle, and I have I love the guy. I have so much respect for him. So anyway, when you when you can get <laughs> Brett to turn away or put his hand up to yeah. block his smile from being shown, that's a pretty good day at the office. That was yeah, my that, that's 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 tremendous. I, I, I before you yeah, go yeah. ahead. No, I was just gonna say, um, and I I want to just say like. Without Bret Hart, I never would have got into the WWF. And Bret was such a great, and I don't think he gets the credit for how many Canadian guys he helped. Because again, in, in 94, 95, there was not a clear path as a Canadian guy to how you got in there. And he really broke the door down for guys like myself and more importantly, guys like Edge. Um, I don't think Bret always gets credit for that, but he very much changed how independent Canadian talent were viewed. We're sitting there shooting a breeze at 316 Gimmick Street. Before we take a break, talk about Killing the Town. Uh, Killing the Town podcast. We're on the Jericho Network, part of Podcast One. We drop every late Monday night, early Tuesday morning. It's myself and Lance Storm. And uh, we have a kind of an odd couple dynamic. A lot of We've known each other about 25, 30 years. And uh, we're a PhD class in pro wrestling. We try to really get into the detail. We're coming right back with Don Callis. Hey, have you heard? Podcast One has a whole bunch of awesome new shows filled with big names that are waiting for you on our brand new amazing app. This one's a game changer. There's Norman Lear talking to Amy Poehler, Julia Louis-Dreyfus, and Charles Barkley. Geffen Playhouse Unscripted with Brian Cranston, Josh Gad, and soon Neil Patrick Harris. Nice. OC Real Housewife, Heather Dubrow's World, Lady Gang's Three Mimosa Podcast with Leah Michelle, Nelly Furtado, L. King, and more. Plus every episode of The Adam Carolla Show, Dan Patrick, and Rich Eisen. And if you like what happens in the ring, we've got Steve Austin, Chris Jericho, Chael Sonnen, and a whole bunch more. So download our one of a kind new app and see for yourself. Go to the App Store, Google Play, or download it now at podcast1.com. Steve Austin. Steve Austin. Unleashed. Unleashed. All right, we uh, left off talking about one of my favorite opponents, if not my favorite opponent of all time, Brett the Hitman Hart, and how he got Canadian talent into the business inside WWF. Mm -hmm. uh, instrumental in your career and Edge as well. I, what did you do for Edge? Um, Edge, is, it, is it that hard for a Canadian guy to get into the WWE? Well, it, it was because there wasn't like a clear path. Um, you've got to do all the visa paperwork and whatnot. And I was a guy who like, I remember when Vince used to come to town, Bulldog Bob Brown, who lived in Winnipeg, would like book the job guys. And Tony, who brought me into the business, always said, don't ever be a job guy on Vince's TV because you'll have a stigma. Now, I don't know if that was true, accurate or not, but I, th I think it was, I'm like, that's no way for me to show what I can do. And I remember I showed up there one time because Brunzel, who was a friend of mine, got me a tryout. And they're going to put me with Terry Taylor, which awesome, right? But I went there and they're like, well, you're a baby face. And I'm like, 
but I've always been a heel. And I remember Rennie Goulet looked at me and he goes, well, if you're a good worker, you can work baby or heel, which is correct. But if you're trying to make an impression, you don't want to be doing something for the first time. So I turned, that was a nine minute match, which could have been good, but I turned it down. So I'm like, as a baby face, I'm fucked. Like I'm, and I've never been a, a guy who could really, people never believe me as a baby face. I've only ever been able to convincingly be a heel. So, um, so yeah, it was just like, there wasn't a clear way in. And if you were not jacked up, like again, I'm, I was six two two ten. edge was six, four, probably two twenty. Um, you didn't fit the mold. So, um, what Brett did was he had the ring at his house and he had guys like Glenn Kalka, um, Adam, uh, Copeland edge. I think Jay Riso was out there as well. And some other guys out there living in Calgary, working out at his house with Leo Burke and himself. And I think that just provided a way in. I remember saying to Brett, do you want me to come to your house? And he's like, you've been in the business six years. You don't, you don't need it. Just stay sharp type of thing. Um, but it was just cool. It's like, and when I, when I didn't get into, when Martel went to WCW, uh, I had heat with the WWF office because they thought that we tried to screw them and go to WCW and they didn't want me, which actually wasn't the case. I didn't, I wanted to go to Vince. It was my dream. I always loved Vince's company. And, uh, it was Brett that saved that. Brett got on the phone with Vince and said, hey, the kid's good. He wants to come to work, blah, blah, blah. And uh, he, Brett called me back. He goes, Vince says, send in your contract. But uh, the original plan was supposed to be for me to be part of the Heart Foundation as the mouthpiece. And then they called me two weeks later and ribbed me with the Truth Commission gimmick. But it was still an opportunity. So segueing off of Brett, going back to yeah. the Truth Commission and the human oddities. <laughs> oddities what yeah. were you thinking? Uh-huh. You, you know, you, you fancy yourself. I mean, you're a wrestler. Yes, sir. I'm, I'm, to say the wrong word there. You're a wrestler. Yep. And all of a sudden, you're in a managerial role. Yeah. And all of a sudden, you're with the Truth Commission mm-hmm. and the human oddities. I mean, you got to be thinking, what the fuck is going on here? I, I was thinking that. And the oddities thing, the way it happened was um, – they had they they said we're going to give you a new guy because you're getting over as a manager. I said okay, who am I getting? You were. And they said, well, we got three guys coming. And you're going to get one of them. I said, who are they? They said Al Snow, Stephen Regal, and John Tenta. And I went oh. And they're like, do you have a preference? I said, I am a huge mark for Stephen Regal. I fucking love that guy. But I go, I think Al Snow because he was doing the head gimmick in ECW. I'm like you could do like an interpromotional thing where he's bringing the head out, but then the next week the head's got long hair. Then eventually the head's got the gimmick on his head and it's like cross promotional and he comes and we go back and forth. I'm like, boy, that'd be awesome. I said, cause I need a technician. I've got all the giants. I need a technician. Uh, yeah, we can't do that. I said, okay, can I have Regal? Oh, Regal, you know? Yeah, no, you're getting Tenta. I will. Why'd you ask me then? Right. I'm like, okay, earthquake. Awesome. Grew up watching him. He's not going to be earthquake. He's going to have a mask and he's going to have a humpback. I said, why does he have a humpback, Vince? This is Russo. Well, because I've been told that if he has a humpback, he's always got one shoulder up and can't be pinned. So I'm like, so you're ribbing the guy. So then they get, so we're doing promos one day. I'm sitting in the back with Russo and he's like, where are your guys? I'm like, ah, they're coming. I had to like, I got like five guys now, all giants, right? So they're all coming down the hall one after the other. And then Luna was with us too. And uh, Russo looks and he goes, Jesus Christ. <laughs> and I go, I go, yeah, I go. And they're all walking like single file. And I, I meant it as a joke. Like I loved all those guys. I'm like, yeah, I go, we're like a parade of human oddities. And he looks at me and goes, where'd you come up with that? I go, I just said it. He goes, I'll be right back. <laughs> and all of a sudden it was the oddities. And it was like, gonna, it was Russo's pet project. And the, the segment that has been called the worst segment in the history of WWF which was me with the Howard Stern freaks, which was unbelievably bad, uh, and was, I think, Hank the Angry Drunken Dwarf and Crackhead Bob. And, like, those guys were, I don't know if they're drunk, high, messed up, whatever it was, but it's like they basically put me out there with them and it's like cut a promo. So I'm like, how am I going to work this? So I came up with this idea that my character was such an asshole that he would take these people who are messed up and put them on TV to get attention for himself. So I, again, wrote five, six weeks of TV, and we, we actually brought in a, gr- a girl I knew from uh, Detroit who was an exotic dancer um, who had size 88 breasts, Rachel Rockets. And I had her come out and with a white uh, tank top on with these huge, gigantic things that said, smells like ratings. 
and and then she had another t-shirt that said jackal me off on the chest <laughs> so 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 anyway so uh i'm like okay so i'm exploiting so i have to actually book these two guys who have a genetic disorder in mexico they're called the werewolf brothers they're covered head to toe as a i bring them in as a tag team and i had all these freaks that i'm like okay russo you want to do this we're going to do this and it'll lead to i'm trying to make lemonade right in a sense and uh then all of a sudden it was just off and it was like okay we're not doing this anymore but it was a terrible terrible segment and i took heat over that segment too because it was like everyone knew it was a disaster and it was i remember bradshaw saying to me we're we're in winnipeg and uh for a house show right after that i think i was playing crib with someone back when people played crib another thing from the business and bradshaw came in he goes jackal that was the worst goddamn thing i've ever seen in my life I looked at him, I went, you're looking at me like I came up with the idea. I just had to go do it, right? <laughs> well, I give you credit because every time you say something, you're always ready to get over it. doesn't make a shit. I mean, you will. You ain't afraid of no. That's what life's about. And, and it, so here was the other funny thing about the oddities. So, so it's dead now. Now they bring us back, and Vince is like, Vince Russo goes, oh, we're putting Sable with the oddities. I'm like, whoa. We're getting a push now, right? Oh, yeah, it's going to be a huge push. You're not with the group anymore. I'm like, what? They're like, Vince thinks you're too talented for these guys. I'm like, yeah, but they're going on the road making money, and I'm sitting on my ass, so I'd rather not be talented and make the money. But how Kurgan turned into an oddity was after the WrestleMania where you took the belt from Sean and then Mike Tyson, I'm at the after party, and Kurgan's there with his wife, and Kurgan... uh, Kurgan says, my wife's going to have me dance. I'm going to get up and dance. I'm sure you'll have a laugh. I go, dude, don't do it. He's like, why? I go, don't let Vince see you up dancing. And he's like, well, my wife wants me to dance, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, don't do it. He got up and he's dancing, disco dance, whatever. He's pretty good. But I'm not watching him. I'm watching Vince. And I saw Vince catch the eye. And I'm like, he's not a giant anymore. And within a month, he was in a tuxedo dancing. And then that's the night I learned... Don't ever do anything in front of Vince that you don't want to do in front of millions of people. Who's, who's doing the dancing? Kurgan. Hey, whatever happened to Kurgan? Had a successful run as an actor. Uh, he's been in a bunch of big movies. He's actually done really well. I talked to him about six months ago. Honestly, I can say maybe the nicest guy with the best heart I've ever met in the business. Just a super guy. Who probably, he's, he's, a, he's a tall guy who had a great look. And probably should have gone further as a wrestler, but I think they rushed him a little bit. Don, I don't know if you can hear. There's workers in the background. My dog is going ballistic. It's just tearing the shit out of me. I'm killing my podcast right now. You're the host <laughs> of your own podcast. Listen, killing my, the town my... with Landstorm. <laughs> this, the, the, but this is the, the one-man clusterfuck. And now you've been dragged into the... the, the <laughs> Quagmire that I live my life. But the in. dogs are over, though. That's the, the thing. Goddamn, the dogs are over. <laughs> what, what is Kurgan doing now? I thought he got into some acting or something. He he was in a bunch of uh, big movies. Actually, is kind of playing a heater, and uh, he's got a job in uh, New Brunswick. I talked to him about six months ago about that, and uh, still doing some acting. But I think it's like more of a sideline thing. Well, that was awkward enough. Where do we leave off? Pick me up. Call a high spot. Jesus Christ. Uh, I can't be Jesus Christ. <laughs> so you're willing to be Jesus Christ? I was willing to do anything to get over. I didn't really care. I, it, anything they came up with that indicated Vince saw something in me, I was willing to give it 100% because it was like I'd kind of been that close a, b- a bunch of times. So I was like, I just want to get over the hump. Like, I think I, I can do it, but they have to believe I can do it, you know? So, But that gimmick was gonna get a lot of heat if you start to portray yourself that way in the u.s i think so when uh you did the thing uh that was kind of going down you pitched the crush type thing in yeah. waco they backed off because they were they feeling did. the heat yeah was that about the time when they cut the the legs off the the gold dust gimmick for a shoot uh that might have been around that same time period yeah because was that Give or take, was that ninety six or seven, or was that ninety seven? That was like because I was riding with Goldust when I first when I first came in as ringmaster. I, th- I might have been stone cold, but me and Dustin used to travel together. Yeah. And when they gave him the green light with that Goldust thing, I mean, man, he had some shoot was awesome. heat. Yeah, and he was working every night with Shawn Michaels, and they were working a main event. I was working probably third, fourth match on the card, mm-hmm. whatever. So me and Dustin ride the show. Sean and uh, Dustin would light it up for the main event every single night. And, of course, you know, two guys at Caliper, you know, it was, it was a lights-out match every single house show. 
But God damn, Dustin had a shit pile of heat. But then all of a sudden, the backlash started kind of coming yeah. in. And they chopped his legs out. Mm-hmm. And now I'm so happy for the guy because he's still up and running. He's a great he's worker. He's doing some of the best work yeah. he's ever done. He can still move at the rate he can move. Yeah. I don't know how he can do it at that age. But, man, when they truly had the green light and the focus on him, that was an awesome gimmick. What did you think of that? Uh, I thought it was fantastic. I thought what a great way for him to come out be able to do his own thing. He was always a, a, an excellent worker, but I think he showed people a lot of his creativity. But it's hard to do a gimmick like that if they start to pull back on it, I think. Well, yeah, they, if they start pulling back at on anything, you're kind of dead in the water. Hey, man, we were, uh, last time we talked, uh, New Japan was coming to Long Beach July 1st and 2nd, and Cody Rhodes is booked on the first night with o- Tanahashi? Uh, Okada. Okada. So... What did you think when Cody Rhodes left WWE and just decided to go his own route, ended up being the Ring of Honor champion, and then all of a sudden he's headlining some great matches with top Uh, Japanese talent? I think it takes a lot of guts to break away from something you're comfortable with and kind of go out there and do it. And I think Cody, from what I understand, he came up through the WWF system, WWE system. So he didn't have that opportunity to kind of be out on the road like a lot of us did grinding, doing your own thing. It almost is reverse. So I think, you know, good for him to go do that. But at the end of the day, he bet on himself. He bet on himself that he could get over by himself because that's kind of what he's doing. And I think he's done a great job with it. Now, where he takes it from here... Who knows? But I think, as you know, there's something nice about calling your own shot, too. There's something nice uh, to calling your own shots. But like you said, dude, it takes a lot of guts to walk away from a company the size of WWE when, dude, you you know all the other companies in the United States. But, you know, if you're in this business, to me, you want to work for WWF. And so to to, to jump off when both him and his wife were employed there, right, Mm -hmm. and then go do his own thing. I give him a lot of credit for that. Absolutely. I remember Bret Hart saying when he when he was thinking about leaving WWF for WCW, he said, it, I think he likened it to being in prison. You know, you're, you've got your cell just the way you like it. You know the guards, you know the yard, and now you're going to go somewhere else. It's it, There's that stress, too. It's like if you're familiar with it, it's comfortable for you to come to work every day. So, yeah, it takes a lot of guts. And, and to, to bet on yourself in the most public of stages, too, I think he deserves a lot of credit. I always thought that they didn't let him go in. The first time I heard him on, I think it was Jericho's podcast, I'm like, this guy's funny. This guy's got a real good sense of humor, good personality. I don't know that it ever came out in the other environment as much because they got so many guys. Now it's coming out and people are seeing it. Who, who had the sense of humor? Cody. Oh, I, yeah, I didn't really think, uh, I didn't. I don't know him well enough to know that he has that sense of humor. Yeah, no, he's he's a real entertaining guy. You kind of like just let him go in a podcast environment. So, and I think that's going to start to come out even more than it already is as he does his thing with the Bullet Club. So, The Bullet Club, to me, that has been uh, uh, a faction of guys that has kind of transcended the business. Yeah. I mean, it's crossed over culturally. I mean, their stuff, I mean, I know they do Ring of Honor stuff, but basically mainstays in Japan. Yeah. Uh, how is the New Japan machine, uh, or how important is that to the New Japan product? I think it's really important because it's probably the one group that really transcends geographic borders. And it's almost become like, kind of like WWE and ECW, where, like, where the brand Bullet Club is almost, other than Omega and the Bucks, it's, and now Cody, the other guys, although they're all great, you can move pieces in and out because the Bullet Club is so over. It, I don't say it doesn't matter, but it almost doesn't matter. And um, it's so weird for me, though, because like I'll see guys like the Bucks and they're doing the Wolf Pack thing and the Too Sweet and all the stuff they do. And for me, because I'm almost like, in, like I'm a time capsule, right? I got out of the business in 01 and I didn't follow it at all until last year. So I see this and I go, well, this is a lame knockoff of the NWO. Why would anyone do this click knockoff? But the people that are watching it see the click stuff is way in the past right. and they're young and whatever. So it's so weird for me to kind of come out of that time capsule and go, oh my God, why? It's like to me, if, if in 1997, I went out and was going woo woo and doing Ric Flair. It's like, <laughs> yeah, we know you like Ric Flair. Don't be a mark. But the stuff is over and it's like, okay, I'm old and I've been out of the business. So. I think uh, I talked to Kevin Nash about that. I, I think some of the Bullet Club guys, I thought the story was they gave him a call and said, hey, man, is it cool if 
Yeah. We do your shit out Which here. is and smart. They, and they're like, hey, man, yeah, if you can get it over. I mean, if we got it over and, back in the day. If you want to and, do it, we're and not there's, doing it anymore. And both Haku's kids are, are in the Bullet Club. And those two kids, Gorillas of Destiny, are just absolutely fantastic uh, as a tag team. Uh, Hangman Page. They've got some real good talent in the Bullet Club right now. And I think that... When you have something, a concept that's that over, it's a great place to take good young athletes and give them the rub of the of the gimmick. Yeah, so, so they get their feet on the ground, get some confidence, yeah. get a head of steam rolling, and yeah. all of a sudden it's uh, guilt by association, get over by association, yeah. get a rub, and all of a sudden, you know, it's like some of those uh, guys have some tenure that have been there for a while, start leaving, and then other mm-hmm. guys come in. You keep the you, you keep everything strong. And I think the smart thing that Kenny and the Bucks did was they came up with this idea of the elite. So it's like the group within the Bullet Club, and it's like, okay, these are the three guys who are really the top top talent. And that has caught on like wildfire. It really has. Yeah, I mean, I know that. Uh, Kenny's t-shirts are like one of the, if not the, one of the hottest selling things on pro wrestling tees. And, and, uh, and I don't even know, like the, and to me, these guys are kind of doing it themselves. It's like, if you actually had a marketing machine behind you, or you had a a talent agency, like how many more of these things would you sell? I think uh, they've gotten over organically, right? Which is, you know, better than anyone. That's the best way to get over. I mean, because now you've got a a bottom up groundswell of support uh, for what you're doing. Hey, let's go back to the podcast real quick uh, and give a final plug for New Japan Pro Wrestling. My dogs are tearing the place apart. The contractors are here. I got to check on the next door situation. Uh, our good friend Paul Lazenby has been held up at the airport. Shit has gone awry. You've got a production meeting along with other publicity things to do today. Uh, bring, uh, let's bring it home. New Japan Pro Wrestling and the podcast. Yeah, so I- <laughs> what I'm telling you, Hershey, shut up. We're at Key Stacy, keep this in. I want you to experience I'm over this. with the dog. Yeah, yeah, no, no, I don't want you to experience this bullshit. So when you, you go back to tell tell Lance, yeah, when he said it's a cluster fuck, he ain't lying. It's a shooting. He got color while we were doing the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Killing the Town podcast where my dogs and my cats do regular run-ins as well and I tell Lance to leave it in so I'm used to it uh, uh, on the Jericho Network and we have a lot of fun hopefully people will check us out and uh, New Japan Pro Wrestling uh, Kevin Kelly and I do the uh, commentary for New Japan World that's a subscription service 999 yen or about 9 bucks US uh, price of a couple of lattes at the coffee bean or whatever. Uh, it, it, if you love wrestling, then you need to be on that subscription service because it's awesome. And I'm gonna, I'm a, I may just go 90s on you tonight. I may get out the high techs and the Zubas and head down to the Viper Room on Sunset tonight. <laughs> I don't think Johnny Depp still owns it, but... <laughs> Johnny's got heat on him right He's now. He's got major heat. <laughs> yeah, he did kayfabe, brother. Don, it was good talking to yeah. you. Thank you, Steve. All right, everybody, it's time to close this podcast down. I'm going to close this podcast down with a story. It ain't a happy story, but I talk about my dog so much, that's the only reason I'm sharing it with you. And uh, the bottom line is, last night we had to put Hershey down. And we found out just the other day, after two emergency trips to the vet, Hershey had a very large, aggressive, cancerous tumor on her heart. It was filling up her pericardial sac, which is around the heart, with bloody fluid. We took her to the doctor twice. They drained that fluid off, and she was going downhill fast. Originally, they'd given her a three-month lifespan, and she didn't make it past three or four days. Things got really bad. And I was out here at work, and my wife and I were talking after that second trip to the vet, Things were getting pretty dire, so we made the call that we was going to have to put our to sleep. So I went home yesterday. I got a chance to spend about 45 minutes with her. I was hugging on her, and I was loving on her. And I love that dog. I'm a dog person anyway. I like animals. But, man, me and that dog were thick as thieves. And my wife loves her, too. But she knows the special bond that Hershey and I had. And it was it was very special. I can't express in the words how much I love that dog and how much that dog meant to me and the joy she gave us the 12 and a half years we had her. And she lived to be 14 years in one month. And just the other day when she turned 14, 
I told my wife, I said, man, she looks good. I bet we, maybe she'll last another year. Because I know she's not going to last forever. 14's old for a lab. But I had no indication that she had an aggressive tumor on her heart. And I'm not giving you all the details, but, you know, we rushed her to the emergency room one time. And then the second time I was out here at work, and my wife called me and we knew that it was going to be time to make a call for Hershey. And so we lined up a vet to come to the house to put Hershey down. And as soon as I got off work, I drove my ass in my pickup truck back to the house. I spent about 45 minutes with Hershey. I hugged her and I loved on her. And that vet came in there and she put her to sleep. And then she put her down. And I know that people listening to this show have been through the same stuff I've been through. And you know how much joy and love that animals, which dog, cat, fish, turtle, whatever, bring into your life. I tell you what, man, Hershey the Wonder Dog. I got so many stories about her. I mean good stories. That was the best damn dog in the world. I'm going to miss her. And I'll always have memories of her. Maybe one day I'll do a podcast to tell you funny Hershey stories because I got a million of them. That dog was always pulling ribs on me. She's always pulling hijinks, taking my flip-flops out of the bathroom. And, and we miss her. I'm going to sum this thing up, but I can't express in words how much that dog meant to me or how much I love that dog. And I don't know where a dog's soul or spirit goes when they die. But when I die, my soul and my spirit are going to find Hershey. We're going to jump in a pickup truck. We're going to roll the windows down. And together, we're going to ride off into that big-ass Broken Skull Ranch in the sky. Hershey, I love you. You're the best dog in the world. Hershey, goodbye. <laughs>